think unfortunately we've eaten our way through the planet. We're approaching 7 billion people on the planet. So if we're going to be able to support that sort of uh, population on Earth and not run out of oxygen, natural environment, and all the things that we're balanced with, then we need to do something extraordinary. Trees and forests clean the atmosphere, they clean the water supplies, and they also support the biodiversity of the globe. And if we don't take care of those particular uh, ecosystems, then we're going to see large-scale extinctions, and also it will be very expensive to clean the air and water in the way that forests do. Because of our population is growing so quickly, we're getting to the stage food production and human population will meet for the first time. At the moment, probably 30% of our world's agricultural lands are affected by salinity. By 2050, the experts estimate 50% of all agricultural land that's under irrigation will be affected by salinity. In the global sense of thing, we've been here about that long. And in that time, we've managed to wipe out you know, a couple of million years of development. Nature will rebalance us over the next five million years or so, but we won't be here. If we're going to get some sort of balance and be able to live with that, we're going to have to intervene on our own part. A lot of the plant species, not tree crops, but uh, herb crops that we use, are actually polyploid species. Things like uh, wheat, barley, uh, rice, and also a range of brassica species are polyploids. And so the benefits of polyploidy probably has been appreciated uh, by the crop breeding industry for a while. Polyploidy has been known about for about 140 years, has been recognised as an event within trees, and it's thought to have driven all tree evolution for about 300 million years. Polyploidy, which is the scientific term for the event caused to occur in plants, is a stress response by plants. So if a plant is stressed, it will actually carry out this event. It happens very rarely, very hard to pick up in trees, but it'll do it naturally. The resultant tree is tougher. What we've done is discover how to invoke a polyploid event within a tree, uh, or a plant of any sort, but a tree we'll talk about, and cause that plant to do exactly the same thing it would in nature. And the result is a stable, fertile, new variety of tree or plant. Well, as many people have tried to make polyploids in a laboratory, but they haven't been successful in growing them out. And they haven't been successful of taking that from a simple laboratory experiment out to the field. We've developed a process where we can actually make a polyploid species of a very short time in the laboratory. But I suppose more importantly, we looked at how plants adapt to environmental conditions. And plants are very good at adapting to environmental conditions as they're not like us, they can't get up, they can't walk out of the sun. They have to have a whole bunch of gene sequences that they can rearrange and change to deal with environmental factors on a daily basis. There's only a certain level plant can adapt to. So what we looked at is a way of increasing their environmental resistance by including polyploids in this process. So we make adaptive polyploids. A good example would be a mine site. It's devoid of vegetation. We come back in 100 years time, there'll be all sorts of plants growing there, trees starting to grow. You come back in a thousand years time, you'll have a forest there. That's the slow evolutionary change where plants will slowly adapt to that environment. Adaptive polyploids or adaptive technology is really a way of fast tracking that evolutionary change or the plant's ability to adapt to that environment. So we have a laboratory process that will fast track that, opposed to waiting many hundreds of years or thousands of years for the plants to adapt to that. So this is a whole bunch of our dormant K2s and you know, different lines we have. Let's have a look at this. Oh, look at this, it's full of seed. When Mal came to me, it was more around the, the scientific validation. What he'd found is that as a business owner, uh, going to investors, uh, he just didn't have the credibility uh, to say, well, my product's much better than anything else on the market. Uh, so to be able to then uh, get that independently verified uh, by independent scientists uh, at the University of Queensland, that was uh, uh, highly valuable, I would say, for then taking the company to the next phase in terms of commercialization uh, of that product. 
The results we looked at in terms of the genetics and looking at genomic rearrangements uh, that happen uh, following the polyploidy process, we found that there wasn't evidence for uh, genomic rearrangements that happened. So it means there has been a, a straight duplication uh, of the genome. They were growing well, so growing strongly, and also the lines were fertile as well. So again, that, that's good proof that you've generated a stable uh, plant product that would be suitable uh, for further downstream breeding. Oh yeah, so you know, we've got the two, two pods. So there's, you know, there's probably close to, I don't know, there'd be maybe 500 seeds plus in there. Yeah. The real difference between us, we've perfected a way of developing cell lines what will work in a real environmental condition. The initial berry size we got this plant was, um, fruit size was 12 grams. We're, after putting it through the polyploid process and going through several rounds of selection from there, we've now got the fruit size to 21 grams. This is actually our third generation now. These are the ones, these have come from 21 gram fruit. Now the other important thing, the seed size has gone from the average seed size of all the trophies, 0.7 of a gram. The seeds we're now producing inside the fruit are 1.39 grams on average. Okay. Okay, so we're looking and it's at... it's the seed that has the oil. Exactly. Okay. So this is very important. So we're actually doubled. It's almost doubled. It's almost doubled. Okay. It's so close to doubling, you might as well call it double for okay. intensive purposes. Well, let's call it double. Let's call it double. For many, many years, foresters have been trying to develop a polyploid, stable polyploid version of various tree species, but without success. They can create the polyploid, but it's not stable. The real innovation here is being able to generate polyploid lines of trees. There are many companies and big seed companies, big multinationals that are doing a range of crop uh, base breeding that involves polyploidization, but so far I'm not aware of other uh, companies that are doing uh, trees. Just cut some samples for the DPI for tomorrow. Five year old. Looks like a standard. Yeah, it looks standard. That's up the mountain. Um, unirrigated, unfertilized, and these are our polyploid five-year-old ones. There's actually been tests on wood properties carried out by wood technologists to show that fibre length's the same, density's the same, uh, all the sorts of properties that you, you need to uh, know uh, in terms of the utilisation of the timber. I think we're going to get similar results as last time we went to the DPI. If you remember last time, our four-year-old sample was, had the equivalent density of a ten-year-old tree. So these are five-year-old but they're considerably larger than the last lot. So we'll send these off in the morning and see how we go. The scientific investigation tells you it seems to be more efficient at uh, utilising water, so water uptake, and also more efficient at utilising uh, carbon dioxide photosynthetic uh, capabilities. So there are a number of interesting characteristics uh, of these polyploids that clearly have commercial potential. You've got to look at it more as a shorter time to maturity. That's the better way of looking at a polyploid because of its increased efficiency, etc., You can get the same age tree or the same characteristics of a 10-year-old tree in four years. If people understand what a turbocharger does in a car, you take a car of a certain capacity, the turbocharger, for no input, just uses waste exhaust gas, collects atmospheric oxygen, basically, and stuffs it into the engine and makes a two-litre engine work like a three-litre engine, so you get an increase in power output for no increase in fuel, and the only thing you're consuming is free air, then what we do is very much the same with a tree. By creating a polygenomic variety of a tree, the tree is able to draw in more atmospheric carbon dioxide and to use that to increase its growth. So we get a 30 to 50% increase in growth rate using only free gas from the atmosphere, in this case, carbon dioxide. Got a little carry pint, three years old, it's doing it rather tough. Pretty bad conditions. We've had fairly dry weather for the last three years. It's a bit stumpy. It's very stumpy. Let's go look at its clone. And here's our three year old polyploid clone. It's looking very good actually, considering it's growing in exactly the same conditions. Most people like to eyeball something in the field, they like to see it. No matter, you can have as many bit papers as we do have verification from the University of Queensland, solid scientific papers published in reputable journals, but 
uh, it's much better to go out in the field and uh, uh, where people can see the benefits quickly and visibly. The PGX process isn't a genetically modified process at all. It's got nothing to do with GMOs. It just simply takes a natural process and speeds it up. What have we got? 1,500 plants here ready for planting down at Talabudra. We'll get some biomass in the next couple of weeks and then hopefully by Christmas we'll start to have something to look at. Plants are global and what we do is enhance the performance of plants naturally. Wherever plants are used in the support of human life and that's practically everywhere whether you're feeding livestock that you're going to eat as meat or whether you're consuming vegetables or whether you're using byproducts of that timber to build your house or fuel your fires or drive your cars through biofuel or something like that. Plants are global and the application of our technology is global in terms of plants, particularly trees. What the PGX process allows us to do is to establish those forests more quickly and also to introduce this level of environmental resilience so which enables them to be established over a much wider range of site types and, uh, and, some, and a wider climatic spread. This gives the PGX process then wider application with any particular species for which it's been developed. In Brazil, for example, the major eucalypt plantations are producing pulpwood up to a 10-year rotation. So if you can produce the same pulpwood, same volume, on say a 7-year rotation rather than a 10-year rotation, then you're going to have that greater overall production if you look at say a 40-year time frame. So on a 40-year time frame we're going to have seven rotations with PGX version and you'll only have four rotations with the standard. That's just one example. Plants are really good for helping to restore degraded land. So if you've got an area where there's high salinity, plants can actually help take up the salt uh, from the soil and in some cases can also uh, help take up uh, heavy metals or other uh, contaminants in the soil. If we then use polyploid plants uh, for that, then we get a, a product which again grows quicker uh, and larger. So potentially the benefits then uh, are magnified by using polyploid plants uh, for those types of situations. Just in the mining industry alone, there is just so many mines around the world. And the problem with all the mines, no one's come up with a decent remediation system to close these mines off. Often mines have to be dewatered, so you have to remove water that's sitting over the top of the ore body. So you pump that water out, but it's come up from deep aquifers, often it's contaminated with arsenic, heavy metals and things of that nature. The traditional method of getting rid of that is to evaporate it, so you flood it out onto the ground and it evaporates at about 25 mil a day in summer. So you end up with a five or six kilometre long, one or two kilometre wide evaporation pan. So we're in a position to actually convert what usually looks like a massive hangover, we've got to clean up this mess, um, to a potential new revenue source for the mines at the same time as we're remediating. What we are seeing also is we are seeing now a global carbon market developing. And so, you know, the value of trees to be able to lock up carbon is now, well, nationally and internationally appreciated. And that comes with a dollar value to it. I honestly believe, and I guess that's one of the reasons why I'm interested in the process and its application, that uh, this is literally worth to the world its incalculable worth. It's worth billions of dollars in terms of money. With the carbon markets uh, coming in, I think this company is really placed to do extremely well. For the first time we actually have all the different pieces of the puzzle. We have Professor Andrew Lowe on the academic side to help us with um, polyploids, any university assistance we need. Very good foresters in the line of Dr Bob Fisselway. We have also an extremely good network of other companies like engineers, etc., to actually take the job from a conceptual point to actually growing the species for the environment to actually implementing the final job. And this, is, this is very important, having for the first time all the different um, players involved. The side benefits of doing good business with it 
are an improvement in our environment, improvement in our world, and certainly a lot of things to feel good about. But at the end of the day, we're here to build an excellent business, to service our customers and provide them with products that give them a very, very distinct market edge using our technology to their advantage.